to give you my this is my sort of interpretation of stuff of BS, BSM and how I've worked with it for the last 18 years and, and how that's been corrupted by working with him. And so there'll be bits of that coming out as well. Um, corrupted, modified, adapted, amended. Um, one of those words is appropriate. It is not intended to be pure and theoretical because um, it's a practical tool for solving problems as far as I'm concerned. And the focus of it, is this character here, which is, let's call it the customer and the beneficiary, the person or the persons who characterize everything about the reason we do what we do is to meet some need in the environment of our organization. So viable organizations are purposeful in that they're designed to deliver something to somebody or some bodies of some sort of value. They do that by having things that I should call processes. And randomly, I've given my process three elements because I can't talk to the any more than three. And they, for those of you familiar with the policy literature on manufacturing, might think of this in terms of lean manufacturing. The customer is drawing through the process the thing that is of value. To them. It's all worked terribly well, except um, work, 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 and handovers. And that doesn't work terribly well because it has no mechanism for regulating itself. So we have to add to our process a means of local regulation. The particular set of activities. And Peter mentioned yesterday um, that he's a good regulator, we'll doing all the things that's regulated, and the only way to manage variety is to generate variety. So we start to build a little set of homeo stats. So now we have a process which will do whatever we've designed it to do, which is meeting this person's need, which will regulate itself within the limits of what was designed into it in the first place. And that's important to remember. It could only do what we designed it to do. And actually, for most purposes, what we'll probably find in most organizations is that there's more than one of those. So it could be a set of wards in a hospital, it could be a set of classrooms in a university, it could be a set of degree programs, it doesn't really matter. A set of processes that deliver value to a set of people. Yeah. And as long as we feed it with energy, we'll carry on doing whatever we decided we wanted to do until the time we come home or the customer dies. Mm -hmm. So we've embedded in this thing already some process and some self regulation. The trouble is, it can all go horribly wrong, can't it? Because this one can start fighting with that one. So this one's making better buggy whips and that one's inventing electric cars, you know, um, and they're kind of getting each other's way. So we have to, having created a basic structure, we have to kind of go, how do we keep it all heading in the same direction? So we have to create something that sits over the top of it, that purports to manage it all. Stafford called that system three, the inside of now, um, yeah, I can't remember who came up with managing the present. Was that in your trial log? So he modified stuff at method system and said, well, that doesn't really work terribly well, does it, stuff that uh, works to that general effect? And said, well, actually, what we need to do is we need to start monitoring what's going on at the overall level and start to modify that so we maintain coherence between our multiple processes. And that's also fine and dandy, and there's a lot of sophistication we could put into that around how you gather the information, how you manage it, how you modify it, etc. But essentially, that's kind of what's going on. The risk is one of oppression. So one of the things we've got to be able to do is manage the autonomy of these bits separate from that. Now, for me, we do that by the way we use information. We can come into that a little bit later. So again, we now have a system that says the customer wants these things, these processes deliver it. This job is to maintain the argument between the two, keep the system stable. 
Ah, they do this. We are alive. Come on. You know, what is it? You died of food poisoning or something? There you go, David. Actually, if I can go over the table, I can disrupt three people. I can go all the way around. That's right. Nobody noticed. You're fine. There are no currently no online participants, by the way. That's because you were just at that clock yesterday in the other room, isn't it? Oh, it's I'll tell a story. So, where are we back to? What's interesting about this? There's nothing very much at the moment. Over here, this person exists in a space which is problematic. So, what they said they wanted when we started and what they want now might be somewhat different. And if we carry on doing that, when they want whatever that means, the whole thing is going to go to fail. So they did have a means of finding out what the blighters want next. So we have to look at creating the future of the organization. It's that we call system talk. I'll join that arrow up so it goes all the way into the model. And of course, then what we've done is we've set up an argument. Now, speaking of arguing, I do argue it's kind of the key skill in life. Um, so what we've got is people down here busy wanting to do whatever it is they do, and frankly, in a lean environment, doing it as well as they can. So they get more and more efficient. But if that is fundamentally different or even marginally different to that, then what they're doing is getting better and better and better at doing the wrong thing. So we need to be able to manage a conversation that says, actually, uh, you're going over there, we're going over here, fight, 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 let's change what we're doing. So we've got a tension between those two things. So how do you sort the tension between the two things? Well, you have reference to the question of purpose or, for me, identity. What is the organisation for? What is the need it is seeking to fulfil? And that acts as the arbitrator between the present and the future. The mechanism for dissolving the tension between where we are today and where we'd like to be tomorrow. Now, that's a fundamentally different way of presenting the meta system, which is this bit, for the way that Stafford did it in the original DSM. Now, you can argue that Stafford was wrong, we can argue that it's different. We can just say this is a different way of thinking about the same challenge. This is the thing that fundamentally is very, very useful because it enables us to kind of go, well, that no longer fits what we do next. The really interesting thing is that when we look at that, we think, well, that's really powerful. But this person is central, these persons are in the center, these chief executives are not like creatures, brains the size of several planets, they have a central grasp of the entire universe, so they can direct all these Muppets down here to go where they want them to go. Except they've all got average size range with average size capability. So when we dig inside the thing, what we find down here, we can open up one of these boxes, is that not only has it got its little process inside it, it's also got one of those inside it. So each homeostat has its own trial embedded recursively inside it. And it's sitting there trying to decide where it wants to go next within the constraints of the non provider system. So what we've got is a whole series of trialogues sitting in here, populated by reasonably intelligent people, all desperately trying to do the right thing. Each going in their own way, but massively constrained. So if we're down here, in the, the, let's call it, which call this? Let's call this a procedural level, but at a task level, of a process level, don't mind it at all. And just to keep it simple, I have an organizational level. The organizational level constrains what is doable at the process level. So we decide to build electric cars, not internal combustion engine cars. Why do electric cars keep coming up? 
No, no, me neither. <laughs> well, what car manufacturers need, or what electric car manufacturers need, is supercharger networks. That would be a really good innovation, wouldn't it? Um, you're not, you're not, you're not, there's a risk. You're doing, you're doing quite well. There's a risk in your regional audience. <laughs> <laughs> Only one part of it. Um, processes contain tasks. So the process constrains what is doable within the task, and the task constrains what is doable within the procedure. Okay? And the challenge of being a manager up here is to make that as wide as it possibly can. And that's constrained on a continuum of the other board now, which on one end is about uh, what we call it, let's call it procedure. And at the other end, I'm characterizing badly, I shall call thinking. But if your job is to change tickets in a ticket machine, the constraints are much greater if your job is to invent new ways of running a railway, for example. So this end is very procedure driven. The freedom, the skills, the behaviours of the individuals who carry out the tasks are much more constrained than the freedoms, behaviours, skills of the people that you want to do without inventing new stuff. And what you get, of course, is you get tempted to get bright people down here and you do get lots of bright people down there operating a system that constrains them from being as good as they would be able to be because they're working inside an organizational system that over constrains them. We had a good example of that last week. We were doing some stuff at the University College London Hospital on Thursday afternoon. And when you talk to NHS people about what's going on in the NHS at the moment, what you get is you know, you've got some really, really good people constrained by a system that doesn't understand what they're trying to do. And we can kind of call that bureaucracy, if you like, because the way that typically we organize ourselves is this system of offices. You're familiar with the notion of bureaucracy? So uh, the person up there is in charge, and then the hierarchy sits underneath them, which maintains the illusion of control in a vertical domain. But actually, what we've established here is our illusion of control exists in a horizontal plane. It's about the process of producing the service or product or whatever it is the organization is trying to do. So our accountability in here is for performance. Our accountability in there is for resource management. Fundamental shift in the way we think about what's going on inside the organization. Here, I'm interested in, in my train three minutes late. Yeah. Here, I'm interested in did I operate within the budget I was allocated? Whether or not the customer got what they wanted doesn't matter in that model, because what matters is that I was accountable for resources at the end. Okay. Interestingly, there, you made it right. You, you know, you, you, you're also looking at how you can release the human potential of the organisation. Okay, everything that I've said so far is absolutely right. And uh, this box here, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is a synthesis of skills. I never know how to dis distinguish skills from behaviors. Is how I behave a skill as much as the ability to hold the world. If I could hold a pen and write neatly with it, the skill of holding a pen and writing neatly with it would be and process. It's a synthesis of those two things through, it won't surprise you to hear, this notion of stuff we call information. So I behave like I do because the feedback I get from the people I'm talking to either encourages me or discourages me from whatever I'm doing occasionally at the moment. And that's just an information flow. Similarly, when I pass a product on from process one to process two, from task one to task two within a process, my feedback loop is looking there and saying, well, hmm, that wasn't very good, what can you do it better next time? Or that was fine. So we have all sorts of in the organization, all sorts of quality systems, for example, which are bizarre and bonkers things for the most part, 
that their job is to provide information, feedback, the previous process to say, this is how well you did. And the management task sitting in there is to work out how to do it better next time. It's really good. Yeah, this is really simple stuff. I don't know why we can't do it. So information coming back says, this is how well or badly you did. Manager sitting there saying, oh, that wasn't very good, was it? How do I do it better next time? Do I change the process? Do I change the skills that I find, the process? Do I need somebody with a bigger, longer screwdriver or whatever? Do I need people who behave differently? Or do I need some sentence? No. This is Steve Battle. Welcome, oh, Steve. The um, purpose is to create the illusion across that. So we end up with these systems. So actually, because at the moment everything's uh, it, what we're talking about is very positive without developing something uh, for the for the better, I suppose. It's just always the purpose of it. So you can see, John will pick that up. To check my bit. Okay. <laughs> to help you. Uh, really? thing about skills and behaviors. Yeah. For me, one of the distinctions there, and it's not it's not it's not perfect. Skill is something I can do. A behavioral will have a in it, my motivation, my attempt, my will to do stuff. Okay, that's how I would and that picks up a little bit. So John, now you can comment next back. Okay. If I've written three words down there because I think they're really, 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 really important words. What I've been describing so far has been mainly a what, a little bit of a how, and what's really important is the why, and the why links us back to that question of purpose. Now, to your question, Brian, if, we, if an organisation, if a multi organisation adopting this thinking is going to be viable, is going to survive, but its purpose has to be legitimate. So there has to be an alignment between what the organisation is doing, trying to do, and what is required in its problematic future. And if it isn't, it can fight against the places for a while, but eventually it gets so the environment to work well with. Chapel Peak Bugley wrote a paper called Food for Three some years ago. Um, roughly off the top of my head, what it said is organisations crap like products in order to generate energy from the environment and sustain themselves with. Yes, yeah, they do that in a way that the environment was not ignoring the delivery of the um, If they do that in a way that the environment doesn't sustain them, they die. So behaviourally, politically, if you like, yes, you can do that to a degree, but ultimately, if the organisation doesn't exist positively in its environment, it will die. It may take quite a long while. Yeah, but unless you can generate something in the environment that supports it, it's yeah. useless. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a whole range I think you could do in the way, you know, given the purpose of the organisation is. Um, I, I think you can go back to legitimate regimes where you've literally got past the organisations mm. that they run within the context because they're actually supported in their sustainability by the fact that they rely to power. But so oh, this is, yeah. this is, my proposition on that is the energy cost of the energy cost of policing the environment, managing the environment in that way, renders them unsustainable. They spend so much energy maintaining their degree of control. All the autonomy is lost down here, and what you end up with is ball bearing factory in Vladivostok, where we make 500 tons of ball bearings. Yeah, all right, so we make five 100 ton ball bearings. Yeah. Um, it's objective achieved. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of so. So yes, you can modify the environment to support them in such a way for a period of time. But the energy cost of maintaining that means the whole thing loses its viability. Now, whether that's financial viability, probably there's a constraint upon the continued existence of the organisation. I think this yeah. quote from Stafford. Um, so you've got profit, you've got environment, you've got societal. You've got a whole bunch of constraints that you think about that says, you know, how do we manage this organization in such a way that it retains legitimacy in its context? And Clinton Roberts, I think it was 1990 ish, um, the <coughs> accounting as a superhuman auto vehicle system. 
that all organizations, what's your language self approximate over time? Yes. But what that means is says we reproduce ourselves. Peter says no, no, we self approximate, which is reasonable. Um, Autopoiesis is fine. Pathological autopoiesis says we're producing ourselves in such a manner that we make ourselves ill. So the equivalent of human bodies is, is, is cancerous cells that they're replicating and damaging the homes in looking after themselves. You get a lot of that in the HR department, sometimes in the finance department, and definitely in the quality department. Yeah, they're, they're sort of they can behave in manners that look and feel cancerous. In your case, I suppose it's the um, People who should purchase all these things, you know. They run a process which is designed to stop them supplying anything for anybody for a very long period of time. It's quite common. Um, I'm conscious that Brian's had a good question. We've taken us down a slight yeah, detail. Yeah. And, and, and just want to make sure you <clears throat> finish what you want in the next five or ten minutes so we can. It's a lot. Good yeah. Well, get back on track. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure there ever was one, Chris. Um, so that's kind of an interpretation of the SM in terms of, of my interpretation of intelligent organization. This is kind of the way I work with it with, with, with clients and kind of people. The sophistications in it um, probably need to go on a different board. Um, sorry? It always was a three body problem. Isn't it? It's just labeling it doesn't help, does it? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the whole point about this is that if that's changing and it has some sort of rate of change going on in it, if the organization is going to remain stable, it has to adapt to the environment at the same rate as the environment is changing, whether or not it's, it's implementing that change in the environment or not. It's so, like with um, Vina when he said with, with his uh, aircraft, um, anti-aircraft missiles that we have to shoot for where it's going, not where it was, visit the shop where it was, and it'd be gone by the time it got there. Yeah. So the organisation has to constantly look for where everything else is going. So yeah, so it's not about what's happening now, it's what's about happening then, some unspecified point in the future. And how we, as the managers within that, actually seek to adapt the organization to the future and seek to adapt the environment to the future we want to have. So, if you're a railway operator, um, then the thing is you really need you've got some passengers and training and infrastructure. So, you want to sustain the market for train journeys because that's what helps to keep your organization alive. If you're a healthcare operator, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? If you're a hospital, what's your core business? Coffee making. Coffee making, yeah. Well, supposedly curing sick people. Yeah. But if you cure all the sick people, there's no need for a hospital. So to sustain your organization, you need a constant population of ill people. If you look at what's happened over the last 70 years of the NHS, what it's done is consistently redefined illness in this space, not necessarily for bad reasons, but that the effect of doing that is to sustain the need for a healthcare provision system. Then you thought that by having a national health service, you reduce, make the population healthy, therefore reduce the need for the health service. So actually the cost will go down rather than increase. Now as we've redefined it's the same for said inspection of the secret service and quite a few other outfits to think about it too. Yeah. Let it go where it goes, it's kind of uncomfortable. So, no, 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 um, no, 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 no. Just, just want to make sure you see the whole picture, you're looking at the outside environment, and there's kind of boundaries there as well. Boundaries? I think I was bringing up boundaries. Well, that's why I'm bringing it up. <laughs> and, then, and then we can you know, see what we go. Well, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff to do with boundaries. So, why have I invented an organization here? And we could at least in principle draw a boundary around it and call it the NHS or railway company or university or whatever else. But actually, if you look inside the most modern organizations, I think Terminal 5, anybody's thrown through, thrown, kind of say, thrown through Terminal 5 at Heathrow. And um, from the point where you get off the train or get out of your car, to the point where you get on your aircraft, how many organizations will handle you? Sadly, I know the answer. 
Have a, have a guess. <laughs> Wait, so you've got off the plane? No, you're, you're getting out of your car or off the train or off the bus and you're getting on a flight and you're flying out of the terminal. It works the other way, but... Right. 40. How many? 40. 40. Or zero? Not quite. Okay. But surprisingly close. The last time I needed a formal count, it was 29. Different legal entities which will handle <laughs> some or all of your journey through that. Airport. When you say entity, when you say entity, do you mean 29 people or 29 separate 29 separate organizations? Oh, I wonder. Yeah, from the transport company, yes. the facilities managers, to the customs people, the chairman. Yeah, you, you see somebody with a British Airways badge, you think they work for Germany, they don't. Yeah, they're an agent of. And then you've got HM Customs and Excise, and you've got border control, and you've got whoever deals with you with WH Smith, and then the different handlings. To look after the boarding gate, etc. So you can go through as many 29 different organizations' hands in a relatively simple process of checking security board. And you don't see it. And increasingly, the organizations that we actually seek to manage are made up of these multi organizational environments, which the borders are invisible. So when you then complain to Consumer credit and say, yeah, they didn't do what I said I wanted them to do. Who is it? Yeah, who is it that we're taking issue with? Because there is no terminal five for some, for example, in that in that sense. So is it the ticket agent who sold me the ticket? Is it the is it the flight that the, the carrier that moved me around? Is it yeah, which of these organizations do I know down and, and, and have in fact? And of course, we manage all that stuff through these things they call partnership, which are always dominated by the biggest supplier in the room. Basically, so complexity arises to some degree because what we've got over here is a sort of almost infinite set of possibilities of what the future we might be preferring for might contain. And you know, classically, in, in, in sort of strategy sessions, they talk about politics and they talk about technology, and they talk about the economy, and they probably talk about some sort of demographics. Pestle thing, isn't it? The society, a whole bunch of stuff going on out there where we're sitting here trying to say, Well, where do we go? Where do we go? Can we go next? So, what we do in order to help us manage that is we create a model within the boundary of the organization. We create a model. What's the problem with models? They're not always accurate. Well, they're always wrong, aren't they? Yeah. So we create a wrong model of the world in which we exist, which is informed by our particular sets of prejudices, our knowledge, our insights, our skills, our behavior. Um, so we actually look into the model, and we talked about Plato yesterday. This is the shadows on the back of the cave. Yeah? And we're bringing in so the shadows on the back of the cave are there, real worlds out there. And we've chosen, we don't think about this, we've chosen what to do. Over here, Simplifying our organization greatly. We created a model of the organization. We're back to the tension that sits between the two of them. It's okay, in here, here's my mental model of me. There's my mental model of what's going on in the world outside me. And I'm sitting in the middle having a very triangular discussion. I don't know why I chose a triangle, I just chose a triangle. It tries to help me work out which bit of that do I want this to respond to, which bit of this needs to wither and die, what needs to be created to replace it in order to make a decision about what I want my tomorrow to look like. What's the problem with tomorrows? They change very rapidly. They change very rapidly, yeah. So whatever it was I thought I was preparing for the time I thought it was preparing for it probably isn't going to be there when I when I get there, unless I'm spending a lot of energy modifying it to where I want it to be, which we call marketing, typically. The activity of modifying the environment is marketing. So it's really marketing people in the strategy session next door. And um, great thing about marketing is you can understand precisely. How valuable it is, and you can understand precisely which bits of it are useful and which bits of it aren't. Because you do that with this stuff, 
What action did I take in my environment in order to modify it? What response did I get from that modifying activity? If none, then probably don't do that again and do something else in the future. So marketing is very easy to, to understand. Over here, we have this thing, which we'll call the purposes of today, business change. And that's the translation of, if that's the future we want to create for ourselves, and this is our present, then these are the things we need to modify in order to align the two, or not. And of course, what we end up with in our organisations is lots of directors of business change or directors of transformation, transformation projects, change projects, whatever they call them. What they fail to realise is that the vast majority of the population are down here are all busy keeping things the same. Because actually, I'm down here, I've got my process, it works, I've got my information, I've got my team, I've got my skills, I've got my behaviours, it all kind of works for me. Why on earth do I want to change it? Because when I'm here, I can't see that, let alone possibly that. So the perspective that this has, the view of the world that the organisational ultimate meta system has of what's going on in its environment is a very different view to that which is held at the process level. Because I'm standing higher up the mountain, I can see more things very, very simply. Stafford called it um, intrasystemic omniscience is looking down into that. So I guess extra systemic omniscience looking out in, into the world. So the worldview of people occupying that box, the worldview of people occupying that box are different, even when they're the same person. But here's the exploded brain slightly. The cybernetics conversation this week is conceived and delivered by the Cybernetics Society, which I happen to be president. So when I'm being president of the Cybernetics Society designing an agenda for the week, I'm sitting up here, looking out into there and thinking, oh, hmm, hmm, what should we do? We might just wait to do interesting stuff, etc. Because I'm not just the president of the society. Because when we're in here doing you know, session one on day two, I'm actually a little process box down there constrained by my membership of the higher order system. So my behaviours and my skills, my knowledge set that I can apply are different because I'm sitting here at the moment, not sitting there. And at about quarter to 11, I'll make sure we'll get a cup of coffee and make sure lunch turns up on time and all that boring stuff. I'll go back in, I'll actually go into that box, won't I? I'll go back into the managing the present box for a while, a bit later on. And tonight I'll be thinking about how did today go? What does tomorrow look like? Are we still doing what we said we'd do? Have the interesting conversation? Do I need to get anything different to happen tomorrow when the girls end up from Cardiff? Yeah. And then tomorrow afternoon I'll disappear back into one of these boxes where Duncan will be in charge of the session and I'll be kind of holding it home. So we have this, again, this delusion of these sort of bureaucratic models. But I sit inside that box, my bureau, and I direct and control the things that happen beneath me, and I respond to positively and conservatively the directions I'm given from the people that sit above me. But actually, in our real organisation, we're moving around all the time, and as we move between the different bits of the organisation, so our behaviours have to change. The skills we can apply become different. And if we recognise that, it becomes really easy and fluid. We don't recognise it. What we do is we um, we become all of that, and we get onto a call where we're having a grand strategy call about can you build a season the agnostic railway model? Yes, of course I can. And then so we're having this conversation with Oliver and explaining it. We're going to tell passengers that three minutes late, etc. And Oliver says, "What colour is it going to be? What's it going to look like?" And Oliver's gone from there down into here because actually he's asking a question about what I would regard as mental trivia compared to the grand conceptual schema that we're trying to put together. I'm being called to Oliver. That's fine you're being called Oliver. You've got my suit. Try and contact me now. Um, <laughs> but I think, John, one thing that stands out for me here, uh, and certainly my experience of this, is that difference between the sort of temporality of some of this, certainly in that top job, and then stasis of him, and that conflict between the two, because actually that's a real problem. And he's tension. Actually, tension. 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 Tension.
it's actually as well translating that to, to develop the fluidity, fluidity between those who are involved in this these tasks down here with that and the space bit and then seeing the meta system itself. So it's not the people necessarily, the Oliver's that go between, it's the translation of that, what they, they see into those parts. That's why you need somebody that can see that stuff, but also gets that to it. Yeah. And, um, the simple answer to that question is, is yes. Yeah. The problem is we're, we're educated, <laughs> we're educated into this box. So when, when people talk to us about organizations and management, who do I report to and who reports to me? What budget am I responsible for? What am I held to account for? Is this bureaucratic system of offices that was a Max Weber 1923-24-ish um, thinking? And that doesn't fit well with an understanding that sits in there. Now, what you're talking about is really interesting. You've all heard of distress. People who are distressed because they're, they're in a state of unacceptable tension. And it's also new stress, good stress. And the task is to get some sort of balance that says there's enough stress, there's enough tension, but these things can happen. There's a realization that the dynamics of the thing actually have to play out. But when it gets to be distressing, it's because something under here is under too much tension, too much demand, and can't respond to it. And maybe it can't respond to it because its mental model is that, but it says, if I'm in this box, then I'm constrained by the box that I'm in, and therefore I can't do those things. So people like me who used to be in a box about here somewhere in the bank leave because we can't cope with the distress of being part of that system where you're sitting there and saying, you're all, you're all fools. You're all wrong. I'm, I may be down here in this box, but I'm right and you're all wrong. And I've spent the last 30 years trying to prove that this, demonstrate that this, is a richer way of thinking about it than that, and actually is a more realistic interpretation. I suppose more realistic, it's not right. It's a more realistic interpretation of what's going on in our organisation than anything that looks like a bureaucratic system of offices or its equivalent. So, John, you've just demonstrated your self awareness. Yep. Which is valuable to the question because you often. Coming into a conversation about communication and engagement and the racism is falling down the process of the So, but actually, where I think we should go now is, you know, to the room, because um, I'm conscious that for some of you, that would have been just a kind of, you know, basic level refresher and stuff you've heard for ages. But for others, that might be kind of quite new stuff. So, uh, for the first few minutes, all the questions about where John has said something, where people want to clarify stuff. When you talk about Town Hall 5, you said that you could pass through 29 organisations. Yeah. How would you define an organisation? Uh, well, I was very specifically talking about legal boundaries. So, there are, so there is, a, there is yeah, BA is a limited company, so it has a legal. A legal boundary around it. So yeah, 29 different legally constituted entities, right. um, which are legal personalities, I suppose, would be your language, wouldn't it? Um, but it's but it's from our point of view, it's, it's seamless. And we're sitting here in the university, the university is a charity. Um I don't know how many organizations you encounter here. There's definitely the university, there's definitely Imago who provide the catering and the Wi-Fi and all that sort of stuff. And it's a separate legal entity from that. Our, our experience of it is it's seamless. If you go and get a train journey like Brian did this morning, he'll have gone from home. I don't know whether you've got a bus or a walk to the station, but he'll have got on a London Underground train probably to somewhere else. He'll have then passed through a network rail station to get onto an East Midlands train to arrive in Loughborough to get onto into a taxi. Yeah. In practice, the journey is relatively seamless. What's hiding behind that is a series of bounded entities that come together to create, they don't even know that it. Brian actually creates the process on the fly in that, in that journey, which is sort of quite interesting. So every one of those elements has to have sufficient resilience to absorb the shock of Brian turning up. So you turn up at the station and there are no taxis because there's not sufficient resilience in the taxi system to absorb the shock of that train arriving. But they all use information 
back to this again about what's going on out there. So they know that there's a train due in at 8 32 or wherever it is from London that will always carry a selection of Brian habits, will always want a taxi journey somewhere else. So they're using information to modify where they park at half past eight in the morning. So we don't need to bureaucratically controlled and all that, and say we need a centralized control system for allocating taxes. We just give them some information and they'll turn up where the customer is going to be at an appropriate time because they know it's going to be there. Now, what we could be better at is sharing the information as opposed to creating the control structure to allocate it. And that's a, that's a difference. Uh, does it doesn't sit in the cybernetics or does it sit somewhere else? For me, the core element of the cybernetics is the autonomy of the individual within the overall structure because the autonomous individual makes best use of the information for them working within the constraints that, that sit around them the energy we might then employ managing that individual is kind of wasted as far as i'm concerned because the individual um, you see in the military um Ages ago, when I read uh, what should I read? Legacy, which was about the All Blacks uh, rugby team from New Zealand. And he spoke about the Oogaloo, uh, which is observe, orient, decide, act. And it was about empowering the individuals on the ground in military operations with the ability to process information and then make decisions from it because you can't when you're being shot at by a terrorist organization manager what do i do in this situation you don't have the ability to do that and as organizations in the environment is increasing in complexity i think that the business environment is getting closer to businesses are being shot at by terrorists and or people at the uh, I can't read the hand at the no, very, no. At the very, <laughs> no, the procedural very, level. At the procedural level, um, don't. Sorry, I lost my train of thought now. They don't. Uh, sorry, forgive me. The, the, the procedural level. Uh, don't have. I mean, I was going to make an observation later about the main wall, but it's a bit sort of silly. You know, it illustrates perfectly a good version and a bad version. But what the Ukrainians have done for the clarity purpose, and in the early stage of doing this, not late stage of doing this, they have the NCOs where they understand the overall objective, but can, you know, if suddenly some Russians turn up here, they can do it in something different, which I think is what you were. Know, the ability to. So if you, if you look at the. Yeah. If you look at a big organization, the military is a good example for you. Um, you try to join the military and, and, and the, the first thing they'll do is they'll, they'll turn you into a soldier. I, they'll turn you into somebody who wears the uniform and belongs. Mm -hmm. Then they'll give you a trade. Then they'll set you free to go and do useful, useful stuff. So that's really interesting. They have this notion of, of belongingness, which is really, really powerful. It works in the police, works in the military, works in the NHS, works in the churches. You know, you've got to have that belongingness before I can give you a trade and I can set you free to kill people at your own at your own discretion and organizations like the SAS for example you know, massive involvement and, and, and effort in training people so when they go off and somebody says look you know, go and sort out location x you know, all the skilled people know how to behave they know how to respond so they can be set free and as you say to work out their own solution to the problem they're presented with because not the, to be centrally directed because the information is most valuable at the source point yeah. so you need to be able to empower people at that level. It's funny because I was actually thinking of an example similar to the military where the purpose was so properly known that they had a progress which was um, Osho in Oregon in the USA where they literally built a city from the ground up from the point of sewage systems to an airport to shopping systems. They, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll, um, some of you are familiar with it. But they were able to build the city from nothing because they all were so aligned with their purpose and they didn't even have Osho there to guide them. So when you have that level of empowerment, you 
can release the human potential of getting some of the energy. Yeah. So, so so empower can empowerment, can I just answer on the empowerment yeah. question? I think it's a really, really important one. Um, and uh, yeah, philosophically, for me, it's, it's kind of important. I cannot empower you, any of you. I might be able to create the conditions under which you can empower yourself. But ultimately, the choice sits with the individual. You can sit inside a bureaucratic box there for 45 years, take the money at the end of the month and collect the pension at the end of it and make no bloody difference to anybody whatsoever. And it doesn't matter how much I empower you, unless you empower yourself, it will always remain the same. The model for me here is you know, the people who are operating, whether it's a process, task, procedure level, they're making choices about belongingness. So they exercise, they control their own empowerment in that, in that context. And I think that's quite an important point for me because this works because of autonomy. And autonomy only works if people choose it, ultimately. I was just going to make the point that you gave a series of examples of kind of military or yeah. kind of public service type, and that, that conversation plays out big size of the military world as well. And it would be why you get, um, where I've acted in employee ownership and stuff, why you get people like John Lewis who want their frontline staff to be made donors of their organisation in the same kind of analogy of how you release that. So um, I'm conscious that um, I asked for kind of clarification questions before I go to your hand up. So, so this is on, on a very similar theme yeah. to this uh, about command control um, and about competencies and command control um, at that, you know, that, that homeostatic level that we do empower people and give them um, the competencies and tools to do it. Um, my experience is that the variation you get is absolutely huge. But, but it probably should be, but equally it's got a very different outcome. And, and, that, and I think for me that's what goes back to that purpose, um, because I actually think that that purpose is often quite confused. Certainly big organisations, I don't think there's in most organisations other than when we were at UCL last week, which was when we filmed this on live, but they actually need people. <laughs> Um, when you drew that box onto the John's faces on some of those surgeons' faces, <laughs> something else. And, um, but I do think that in big organisations, there generally isn't a single purpose which does cause often that conflict. And I'm stating the being obvious here, but actually, it's quite important for that big. So, so I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, there a, is there a shared purpose or not? And I think so. So, what you're talking about, and if you take you know, your own mind, a good example, but probably so is Rolls Royce and so is the university. Yeah. It's thinking inside this. So it's constraining people to, to be accountable for resources. So if you go to the management meetings in this institution, I pretty much guarantee that they will say, this is what we said we'd do last month, this is how much we said we'd spend, this is how much we said we'd earn, this is what, and some poor bastard will sit there reading out this tedious report that is already circulated a week in advance that nobody's read and nobody cares about. But they'll get to the end and they'll decide that they've demonstrated accountability for resources because that's what the, you know, the FD wants them to do. Um, meanwhile, all the students are going to hell in a handcart over here because they're all kind of going, well, this is a tedious program of learning, isn't it? I'm not really learning the things I wanted to learn. And frankly, the teachers don't know a lot more than I do and all sorts of other stuff going on. The really good students will empower themselves and navigate their way through this where they will end up with the education that they want. Meanwhile, the university over there will be counting the number of first class degrees it handed out, because you know, that's what it's holding itself accountable for, is badging people, you know, as opposed to educating people. And the two systems are probably quite, quite different <coughs> to each other. So in here, in that, if I want you to perform well, if I want you to share your understanding, then my job as a manager is to create a set of informational conditions where you can understand what we're all trying to achieve together, where you can understand how you contribute to that through the activities that you engage in, and I can hold you to account for delivering outcome. If I hold you to account only for controlling resource, well, guess what? You're going to count the pens at the end of every day. When I had an assistant manager in the bank a long time ago, Derek Grimsgall, he could write equally well with both hands, but could write nothing of interest with either of them. Um, but we had, we had, we were allocated a biro to use, and you had to hand him back the empty biro in order to get the new biro, because he worked in the model of the kind of resources. You'll have realised I can't write very deeply. 
but I had to write the securities ledgers for where people deposited stuff with us, and that was a handwritten ledger with an ink pen. And I had to provide my own pen and ink because I had to really, really slow that down quite fast. Quite, quite maybe with an ink pen, but it's laborious. But yeah, Derek held us to account. You can hand your pen, pen in before you can get a new one. Oh, come to you, come back. I've got to tell people about Oh dear. I was, I was hoping we'd bypass Freya, but never mind. I'd love to get bypassed. My only issue seems to be with this, and I'm trying to get into it, but I look at things literally. So I look at systems theory, and I'm, I'm imagining like tangible, you know, real systems move box around it. But then I look at the VSM, I think, well, you can, you can, you can. If I look at the top box, which you said, but I think the system, system for example, and that is basically the CEO of all the directors. So this, this is the question. So is that the example of what system four would be? Um, so, so I would rather think of it as a set of behaviours than a set of boxes. So we use the representational device of a model to sort of to put it out yeah. there. So in here, yeah. so in, in, in the mental model that you're describing, you've got the bureaucracy, the chief executive sits here, and he or she has this enormous brain, total control of all the resources, and kind of says, well, I was marching left, I'm now going to march right, everybody march right, and off we go. Um, and that's the command and control stuff that the brain is talking about. If you conceive of this as, is this a useful way of thinking about what's going on inside the organisation and sharing it as a, as a way of thinking about the world? So when I run vector consulting, I actually occupy that box, that box, and that box, because I'm kind of going, am I happy? Am I, am I being the best John Vector I can be? And for me, it's very simple. I, I like, to, I like to, to write. I like to do a bit of consulting. I like to do a bit of educating for want of a better way of describing it, which says I have a, I have a picture of the world in my head that I'd like to share with other people, and I do it through these three mechanisms. So am I happy that that's still what I want to do, or do I want to retire, get a pipe and cut the grass? But yeah. If that's what I want to do, am I currently doing well the things that I'm delivering to my various constituent groups? Okay. So I might ask Brian, are you happy with what we're doing, Brian? Is it working? Should we be doing it? Etc. And then I'm thinking, what am I going to do next year? I'm going to write another book. Do I want to create another cybernetics conversation? So I am in all of those boxes. And the boxes are just there to help me tease apart the three different strands of my thinking. So am I reflecting on what I'm for? Am I thinking about what I might do next? Am I thinking about what I'm currently doing, or am I sitting in the middle of the three, literally in the middle of the trial, I'm kind of going, uh, <laughs> if, if I've got the balance of the use stress and the distress right, I'm kind of stable and upright. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm too happy, <laughs> kind of what haven't I noticed in my environment, just about to bite my ankle. And if I'm too unhappy, what am I doing down here that's causing that unhappiness? So, so kind of, in, in a sense, the model gets in the way, because actually what we're saying is, I have three different modes of behavior. Now, in a very large organization, in this organization, there will be a chancellor, I believe it's Seb Co. Um, there will be a vice chancellor, there will be a senate, there will be a bunch of people who call themselves directors. And they'll all sit around having fatuous conversations, which actually look a lot more like this than they look like that, about resource control, about recruiting students, and all sorts of tosh like that. They won't actually think about this stuff at all. They won't realize that this is what they're actually doing. Because what they're doing is they're sitting inside the box that says, I am this person of great importance because I sit in box X at the top of the hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, but, and in addition, I think, Fred's highlighting your kind of mindset motivation. Because actually, you can choose to use this model to talk to your client about, you want to control your organization, here's how you control mm -hmm. your Organization. Yeah. But your mindset um, uh, would get them to understand their structure and system by exploring using the models. So, so, we, so, we, so, so we use this mind, step, yeah. The yeah. mindset that, that, that John is bringing to them. Yeah, and I think as somebody trying to get into it, the only way you can really do it is to think, okay, where, if this was the NHS, we're going to apply that step. Yeah. 
where do things that we recognize that this media well, sort of how would that all fit into that? Trying to extend yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that's fine. Yeah. I think that's getting in the way of the well. I think I'm just telling myself this is real, I ignore that I deal with the, the parents in the, the, the kind of what's and why rather than whether they're a CEO or and, and this is yeah, the trap that people the trap that people fall into is they paint themselves into a box. Mm -hmm. And they don't actually understand that this is all this is the behavioral model of organization. If you like, when I'm standing in a position, mean, he did this 30 years ago in St. Albans, he's a mean bugger. Um, he took the entire crew of a finance company onto the roof of their building on a hot sunny day and made them walk through the VSM and said, You know, and, and, you know the chief executive sort of stood up in that box uh, and he wanted to say something about operations, but you can't do that, you've got to walk over there to say it, you've got to be in that box. To say those things because you can't see that from where you're where you're standing. Yeah, and the other I care of John is also created some stuff. But that is the the label of the whole organization conversation. The first one was run the organization without the CEO and show them what they couldn't do without the decisions and the words and then put the end goes. And the point about that, and I you might know Steve because I can't remember. Somebody's well, this is important. Somebody's robots. Um, I can't remember which one it was, and I'm reading it was either Twine or, or Pickering, but I was reading it in where they created a robot and they gave the robot to the central target or the target data. There were two things like it. One was that the latency in communication was too down in slow, so the central, central processing unit couldn't cope with the local decision making. That was one bit of it. And the other was it drove the thing mad because it ended up with two different targets. The hidden built robot, very early days. I just want, if, could I, because I'm adding to what Craig said, is that just because it's your title doesn't mean that's the behavior that you actually exude. Absolutely. Um, I, I always stop when I actually use the things I've learned in my degree discussions. <laughs> but the, the Hawthorne studies with the bank wiring study, where they observe and ask them to uh, increase their outcome of the tasks that they were doing and their outcome actually decreased and the problem was is that the managers had less of a managing influence than the social groups that the workers were a part of so just because you're a manager doesn't mean that you're actually doing the managing behaviors um, i see it in home bargains so we will have experienced members of the procedural team who will have more of a managing effect than the actual managing team. So don't get <laughs> don't confuse between roles and behaviours because they're not always the same. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. And I, I, I think I think some problem though is I'm trying to interpret this by applying vertical. And that's where I'm going wrong. I need to no, it's not it's not a question of going wrong. It's a question it, it, it's a it's a how do you see the organization? This is yeah, this is an inter Interpretation and Stafford would probably throw his hands up in horror at some of the things that I've said this morning. That'd be fine, it's a good argument. Um, but it, it, it's sort of extracting from it. So is this a useful way of thinking about what's going on here? And and yes, I mean that conversation with the CEO, and we've we've had umpteen of them over many years, is about well, why are you saying that? What is it that's informing why are you behaving like you are? And we <laughs> built Christopher's toy. Yeah. Um, it was a little information system that extracted data from a management, set of management accounts that gave the chief exec a different insight, which changed his behaviour in relation to a whole bunch of other, other people. Didn't change his office. It didn't shift his. You know, he's still accountable for a revenue of whatever it was, three hundred and fifty million pounds a year, and five thousand staff and one hundred and twenty trains a day, and all that sort of stuff. Didn't shift that accountability. What it shifted was his ability to understand his position in the organisation and the information he actually needed and used to make decisions with. It wasn't the you know, I mean, I stuck with him. It came about because I think the first, the first piece was um, he got the management accounts and, and it was about you know, 48 pages of tosh. And actually he needed 13 numbers, was it Pete? Something like, so, something like that. Yeah, so kind of 13 numbers plus the same 13 numbers from last month plus a calculation of which way they were moving. And that was it. And that actually enabled him not just to make different decisions, but to have different conversations yeah. with people. So you overlay then the accountability structure 
over the process structure. And if you want to make a distinction between the two, that's probably, you know, this is a process structure, that's an accountability structure, and they do over they do overlap each other. But hence the obsession, Chris, with this word. See, we haven't touched on data. We've touched on information. So yeah, there's separate the data out there, but actually we make decisions using information, which is which I've structured. Correct. So just to kind of um, synthesize this, what you're saying is that there is the biggest pivotal factor or the biggest pivotal point between being a manager on the right versus the on the left is the sort of perspective and the as you always said, the sort of minds that you have. So what would you say is the greatest problem in the managers, their perspective? So um, you always see it's like their role is a paradox in the sense that even though they are management, so it's excluding themselves, there is a need for even greater integration at grassroots levels. Um, what's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is that we teach people that and then they behave according to it instead of teaching them that and having them behave according to that. I mean, very, very simply, if you go to, you know, you sat in the, in the business analytics class next door and, you know, they're doing the same stuff that you're doing, Rory, probably yeah, at yeah, the yeah, moment, yeah. Um, yeah, they will teach you about bureaucratic systems. They will teach you the role of a manager is, you know, accountability, blah, 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 a whole bunch of stuff. They won't talk about the behavioural and leadership stuff that Chris would talk to you about at some length. So actually, it's not... Um, the accountability is about what I do, the behavioural stuff about how I do it, and the purposeful stuff about why I'm not doing it. So what is it that we're trying to achieve out here? And one of the big problems, what have you noticed about this diagram? I mean, talk about boundary with learning in the conversation. It has no environment. What we design a bureaucracy, we design it in isolation from the context in which it does what it does. And that's, you know, that, that's just bonkers. We're not actually taking any notice of what's happening in the world around us. We're deciding you know, this is what our bureaucracy looks like. It's what our system of offices will be. So, you're right, so I'm sorry. Sorry. Can I just um, ask for my point to clarify further? So, indeed, if that system releases the human potential more. So, if you consider this in the context of psychology, what is a differentiating factor of all an aspect of human psychology that we can exploit? To ensure that our leaders and people at the top operate in that structure as opposed to that one. Because at the end of the day, as you said, the CEOs think they want to bring the size of planets, whereas in reality, that isn't quite the case. Um, also, you say, so what do you think is a differentiating factor from a psychological perspective between the person who is leading an organization that way versus in that way? Can I, can I ask that as a quick example? All right. Because I think that because I haven't got an answer yet. So go on. <laughs> there are organisations that start trying to get that on there, uh, and sometimes it's a healthy organisation, and they haven't had an issue for a long time. They travel along, everything's hunky dory. They start building a lot of this cultural transformation, all that good stuff, because that top line sort of the more question mark of your environment to the top bit is healthy and starts to develop. And moreover. They don't see themselves as family. They invite other organisations to help them. I've seen this go on. Then something catastrophic happens. And they go, let that go there. Because it's a defensive mechanism. Sure. And, and I've, I've seen that again and again. And again it's, it's a delusion of control. So, so what, we, what we like to think when we're, in a, when we're in a position of power is that we have control of what's happening around us. And it's very comforting to feel in control, very discomforting to feel not in control. So one of the things we need to learn to do is to learn to be uncomfortable, actually. And one thing to add would be mm -hmm. how, the question was like, how can psychologically find something to help people get to there? That feeling or one thing would be fulfillment. 
that is more fulfilling than a manager thinking on the test saying do this. That's one psychological perspective why people would want that in a sense. Sure. So on the base, what Brian said, it seems as soon as a critical packet, indeed, as much as they try to embrace that, ultimately, they do revert back to the old days. Under stress. So, so, so see, you, you can work this, and if you work it well and manage the stresses within it, and like, you know, the, the stresses continue to exist. You have you, know, you have a, a fighting chance of making something reasonable happen. Francis, yeah, in 2010, they flooded the railways, and all the energy for the next three years in the railways went into preventing flooding. Now, it was a one in a hundred year event, it had already happened. They were fighting last year's battle, which is what generals tend to do. And of course, what you've got, uh, Pete uh, invented this model. I've got to find a space that I'll put it over here. Um, it's a version of this that says, um, I'm just trying to remember, I could draw it, Pete. Um, this trialogue, get on trialogue as well. What is it? Is that one comes out here? So, what we've got is nested trialogues, three or four of them that go from the strategic level or the political level down to the operational level. I'll have to get that in a little bit in a minute. So, what, what is doable down here on operational level is constrained by. What happens up here? So Brian's leaders within Network Rail think they're in charge, but actually their budget is set by government, their performance expectations are set by government. So the government say, here is some money with which we'd like you to run this much railway. And their managers sitting there saying, with that much money, we can only run that much railway. So they have that tension going on, and it's called a control period where they basically decide what they're going to do with the money over a given period of time. Something bad then happens, and Brian had this, the, the event at um, Carmont two years ago, the accident there, which Brian had a lot of involvement in, stimulated the work we're now doing, where the railway's kind of gone, oh, we've been operating this wonderful bureaucracy for years, and suddenly something has happened which can't be contained within the constraints of that system. So they've gone off to Brian and said, what can we do about this? And Brian said, well, I know a bloke who can do some interesting stuff over here. So the, or the organization is doing well, thinks it's, doing, thinks it's all under control, then an adverse event comes along and disturbs it. And that adverse event says, stimulates the organization to have to do something different. Now, back to your original point, most managers think they're comfortable in a stable situation, they think they're controlling a stable situation, the perturbation comes along and disturbs it, and actually within their skill set and maybe their behaviors, they don't actually have the ability to deal with the perturbation. So what they do is they pull up the draw, the, the, the step ladder, they tighten up the resources, they, they increase the constraints, so they actually demonstrate greater accountability, which very often is precisely the wrong response to the problem that they're presented with. Over here, what they kind of go is say, oh shit, we weren't expecting that. What the hell are we going to do about it? And you're then into this trial of conversation that says, but if this is who we are, getting passengers home on time and safe, and these are the things we're currently doing to do that and they're not working, then what do we need to do? What do we need to invent as a way forward? And how do we cascade that through the organisation? So the managerial questions, totally different. You're actually asking, this is where I am, relative to the things that I was trying to do, what do I need to do next? As opposed to, what did we do last month to do it the same thing? I, I went into, uh, it's confessions time, isn't it? I went into Greg's in Slough when my car was going in for a service. Eight o'clock one morning, a genuine managerial example. Eight o'clock in the morning, that and I wandered across the road and had some breakfast in the cafe. And I sat in the cafe corner over here and um, eating my bacon butty. And a lady comes out from the back of the shop and calls all the staff forward into the shop and says, it's time to do our food handling, health and safety review. So there's six of them stood around, there's me munching away in the back. And she says, right, do you remember what I told you last week? And they all nodded their heads. She's good, she said, I just told you again. Right, back on with it. <laughs> <laughs> but genuine example of, of, of uh, process control, should we call it? In, 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 in Greg's. And that's kind of, I'm actually quite impressed she did it at all. Um, but yeah, but it was done really, really badly. And now how much of that is 
laziness, how much of it is inadvertent. So we don't actually teach people to be managers. We had this conversation last week with our, with our medics. There's you know, 15 people in the room. We had a psychiatrist, a consultant psychiatrist, radiologist, um, nephrologist, that's the kidney bloke, um, and a virologist, plus a couple of directors of nursing and whatever else. It takes about 15 years to train a clinical consultant, which is serious training. What do they do as soon as they're qualified? They put them in charge of something and make them a manager. So I spent 15 years teaching you about virology. Now I want you to go and manage this. Now they're bright people, but their only mental model is that. And that's a very bad inherited model because nobody's ever actually explicitly talked to them about it. No one's ever talked to them about something that looks a bit weird like this. So, of course, what do they do? They try to manage within the mental model that they've inherited, because that's what we do, rather than thinking, is it a better way of, of thinking about managing? Um, so, just, 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 I think this is all kind of bad stuff. There's definitely... You okay? There's definitely some people at the top of the organisations that I would choose not to work with. And it's because they are not motivated by the purpose or sustainability of the organisation. But they are motivated by their own sustainability and purpose. Okay? Um, and, you know, and that is the psychology of the environment. There's some people that are, that are in lead senior positions that are like that. There are lots of others, and that's what John Spinner talked about, who are in that position and have been kind of ill-trained or informed or have learned the wrong ways to do it. And they've got home, okay? So you can work with them. But there are definitely some that are not in the organisation for its own good. And there comes a point where you go, you know, I'm not, and I've given some examples, but you know, some people are not talking about. Okay, thank you, Peter. Obviously, not only do you talk about much, but does something, does it now a question of, finding people to be receptive, because going back to what you said about empowering people, and John like said, I can only create the environment for you to feel empowered, it's a decision you choose yourself. You are allowing yourself to be penetrated by the influences of the environment, which in turn influences of your internal environment. So is it not ultimately a question of priming people to be receptive? So do you guess you're going to Yeah, I, I'm wondering how far I think you've got an applicable answer to the question. You don't have to answer that. I just try and sort of uh, judge from your body language. And it seems to me that how you get people permeable to this kind of approach, I think Omar suggested, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you try and convince them that they will have more fun, which takes you back to sort of Machiavelli, is it uh, better to be uh, loved or feared? And uh, although in some situations fear uh, does seem to pay off in the short term, you can give a whole load of situations where the love, the appreciation, the liking, he's an okay guy, okay, I'll, I'll follow his order and get myself shot, uh, and so on is um, more effective and it, it's persuading yourself that that experience is better than you know giving the job the um, ability to you know sever the variety of you know millions of people below you it does it does take energy and time yeah. to understand this stuff that's you know linear straightforward you know back to Bill's linear thinking yes that's a linear straightforward model of, of, of the illusion of control this is a more complicated model of the illusion of control they're both illusions of control but they're very very different you have to put more, more effort into into getting your mind around this than you do around that and if you were to look at the curriculum of this university and all the other universities in the country as far as teaching management is concerned they'll all teach you that very few, if any, will try and teach you this. That's partly because the academics don't know it, partly because it got a bad reputation 50 years ago and it's never quite got over it, um, partly because there aren't enough people like me around and Pete to actually teach you, which would be helpful. But we're making progress because we're here and we're doing we're doing whatever this is, revolutionary stuff inside a business school, so. Yeah, do you guys I've got two reasons why people might default to bureaucracy. One's cynical and one's positive and optimistic. 
One is the uh, one that I heard from the, the debate about infrastructure, which is that it seems like less of an action to let what has happened to continue happening than to make a change. So if the politician goes into power and lets everything run as normal, it's not seen like they've done as much wrong if things go wrong as if they made a change and then it all exploded. The optimistic one goes back to evolutionary biology, which is theory of mind. And theory of mind is the idea that we can perceive, I can perceive that John Bedford knows things that are different to what I know. Chimps don't have this. They, this is why they're terrible teachers, but we're really good teachers, is because chimps assume that I know, if I was a chimp and John was a chimp, I would assume that everything in John's head is exactly the same as what's in my head. So when he starts doing things that don't make sense, I'm just as confused as he is because I think he's got exactly the same knowledge as me. So why is he doing that? How does this link to bureaucracy? People think it's done before. So maybe they know something that I don't. I'll bring in whiskey as an example. Eight hundreds of years ago when they were making whiskey um, in these giant vats and they would need a new vat because the old one would break, they would look at all of the dents in the whiskey vat, all of the, the holes, all of the, the, the wonky bits, and, and they would take a hammer and they would do exactly the same markings to the new vat because they had the belief that that would have an effect on the flavour of the whiskey. And it did, science has proven that that's correct. But that fundamentally comes back to this theory of mind that we assume that other people have, or we have this understanding that other people know different things to what we do. So if somebody's using bureaucracy, they must have an explanation for it, even if I don't know. So that might be why they can hold that as a bit. And Brian, do you want to say Yes, uh, it, it's just on this bit around <laughs> on the right hand side. So I'm just trying to work on that down. Um, this, this thing is far more dangerous than we actually think because. In, in this side, um, not only do you end up with managers, as your example there, John, you've got somebody who's got potentially years' worth of experience actually doing the operation of taxable, the actual implementation, etc. Then there's something stuck over here where it's it's not just the managers themselves, but the paralysis you get because what, what ends up, and I've, I've, I've generally seen this firsthand, is that they're not equipped to do it. Then, moreover, they're not given the opportunity to give it, other than being stuck with their heads full of e learning about everything from diversity and inclusion, which just creates more and more paralysis about actually making a decision. But the mental health issues we've got up here are all cascaded, you know, and we've seen this time and time again. So, if, if an organization is getting somewhere and then revert back to this, it's not just, it's not just what's happening, but it's actually. There's a, there's a kind of uh, multiplication of those. And, 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 the, and, and the distinction there, in, and, and um, it's one of Pete's expressions, which was used first in an ISO 9000 seminar and with some twerk from BSI, whose name I can't remember. Then he stood there and there was some conversation going on. And Pete said, Yeah, management is also work. And they're, they're, they're really, really important that the, the, the process activity is going on in here. Um, is different to the process activity that's going on in there. It's still a process. It's a process of making a decision. It's a process of, you know, so the output or the outcome of a trial log is a decision. It's work. And we need to do that work with a process that works to generate the decision. And it, it, it doesn't happen. So you, you're right. So, so people are sitting in here thinking, well, if I'm in charge, I've either got to refer it upstairs or do what we did last time. And do what we did last time is the default for most for most people. So the whole suite of, of, of understanding of the world, in which you know, so it's like I can get the bigger reward and I can sit in there and I can do what I'm told and basically act as a post office. And of course, what these things have done, particularly, and this, yeah, the, the power of the cybernetics. We we're talking yesterday, Bill, about about you know about information theory. You know? It's the information theory that lets all of this become meaningful. Because actually, without it, we couldn't have this model of worlds because we couldn't share the information, we couldn't gather it, we couldn't process it, we couldn't package it in a way that lets this work. So we have to default to that 
Because actually, if we go back to a Roman legion, there we had almost 80 soldiers with eight NCOs with a centurion, with 89 people in 100, which is quite bizarre. And yeah, there's a sort of set of legions that work that way. Why? Because I can shout at 80 people, I can't shout at 800. So I have to break it down to the number of people I can shout at simultaneously. Here, I can shout at the entire population simultaneously, given that I have further technology. But I it enables a completely different way of managing, which is rooted in the origins of the information theory that enables the cybernetics to be, to be kind of useful. We couldn't have this on a large scale without the information enabling that goes with it. We can have it, and I had this argument here back at Telos 20 years ago, to scale and all that. Telos was a very collaborative, or set out to be a very collaborative organisation, very behaviourally oriented. Um, how do you scale something that works very personally to you know, a large scale organization? And the answer is you have to create it in a series of, 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 of guerrilla cells, terrorist cells. There's a set of small organizations that communicate across the boundaries back to the boundary point in ways that make, make the communication meaningful, but actually have to maximize then the autonomy of the people within it. So you have to have this manage this tension between. The autonomy of the individual that says this is the things I'm going to do, and the belongingness that means that you've gone to the whole. And that's that's the real tension is how much of a man am I me and how much am I a function of the bureaucracy which I necessarily operate? And that, that can be so it is the reason why I left the bank when I was when I was 30. Because the bank wanted the bank was going over there and wanted these things, and I was going over there and wanted those things, and yeah, the tension becomes too great. And lots and lots of people continue to operate in organisations at various levels of bureaucracy because they don't feel they have a choice. And that comes down very often to this thing. It's the money question. Why do you still do that? Because I've still got a mortgage to pay, I've got kids to feed, educate, whatever. How happy I am, I'm not. Don Ogden, 53, manager of World, well, was then Williams and Williams Bank Churches for I wandered in as a 22-year-old clerk with fit for the AP problem. Wondered in them. What the first thing you did, what do you do? You grant that you go and make the numbers with the, with the manager. Hello, Dr. Ogden. My name is John Beckett. I'm here to sort out your VA service. And there's this 53 year old man saying, Age of my dad, so it was just in tears. What's the matter? Oh, I hate it. Poor bloke, you've just been on holiday, a couple of weeks off, come back to his holiday where you can say that you've got the right juices to harbour and all that sort of lovely stuff. Back to his desk. Good organisation. When he joined it, did this thing around probity and, and, and paternalism and all that sort of stuff. So it lent money to people who didn't need it on the basis that it would be able to pay it back, it gave a particular way. And then shifting to an organisation that was interested in marketing and selling and producing products. But of course, that wasn't his mental model of the world. But then there's a bloke, he's sitting there, he can't afford to leave, he's 53, he's still got a mortgage, he's got two kids at university, he's got a little job he's got to pay for. He can't afford to leave, but he actually can't do the job. So he just sort of sat there in a sort of a, a pot of complete bloody misery. And I feel like the time I'm 21, if I'm miserable when I'm 50, it's going to be my fault and nobody else's. And I wasn't, but it was a sort of choice to, to, to recognize the control of your own misery, the control of your own happiness actually sits with you. And if you let the organization have it for you, you're stuffed. Absolutely stuffed. So, because you mentioned uh, the, the management is work, I think it's worth giving a couple of conversations jumping around here, highlighting that actually management and leadership are kind of skills. And what we're talking about here at the kind of bureaucratic level is that old Peter principle where people get you know, promoted to their level of incompetence, like in the health area, rather than having the kind of skills, mindset, motivation. And manage this. It's a lot about our self employment company running our own. So, so it was a kind of, kind of, I think it's worth saying it's, it, you know, it's work. But yeah. It's also, you know, there's, there's qualities in it. Sorry, I, I wanted to make that brief. Almost no qualities. Oh, your point, and you want to make the point over there. We have a lot of these organizations that are very hierarchical, very bureaucratic. The problem is the majority, you know, let's say in the UK, are like that. Majority of them. So there's young people looking for a job, trying to be fulfilled, trying to find their own way. They will have to most likely join an organization like that. I think you can be more optimistic about what's going on.
Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but, but that's a big problem. Yes, we want to join, we want to grow up, we have our own skills, we want to be you know, more independent than what would be given from a very hierarchical value. Let's say when we're in the NHS. There's not, I don't see much of a solution to that where we do need to leave, we do need a house to join. So, so I think the solution is very simple that if you. Um, I realised as, as a junior analyst when I was sort of 23, I moved into an, an analyst position within, within what was called the Organisation and Methods Department of the bank, um, a sort of internal consultancy. And I realised that as a junior analyst, I could get away with all sorts of stuff that I couldn't get away with if I was more senior. So I could, I could sort of pervert the, the direction of the bank quite nicely as a junior analyst because the work that I was doing there, because it was down here, it was actually invisible to anybody who thought they were important. So I sort of spent quite a lot of time subverting what was going on in terms of the organisational model and the staffing levels in particular to achieve that, you know, to achieve the outcome that we were, we were after. And so if you get further up the hierarchy, people notice the degree to which you're subverting. But by that stage, you've got your mortgage sorted, you've got somewhere to live, and you're too expensive to get rid of. So they have to then accommodate you for a while. But actually, you'll have to do... Um, What's that lovely word? Authenticity. Um, if you are going to be happy, and this is a personal view, if you're going to be happy, if you're going to be content working inside the organisation, you have to bend the organisation to your will. And that's hard work. It's challenging, it's difficult. But actually, if you don't, you're dead. Yeah. And it requires duplicity. When I was going for head, stepping your head chips, I would advise like, you've got to look more manipulable and less of a threat, Dave. You've got opportunities. Yeah. Like, uh, stuff. I mean, this was 30 odd, odd, odd years ago, and in the end, I found I only got employed by more self confident and more intelligent people than average. I obviously was in for which is life. which, which is where I like to think my clients are. Um, so that, so there's something, so there is something in there. Um, well, we should go back into the top of your. You know, managing the whole process. That's your job. That's really facilitating. <laughs> and, my, and my job is to subvert the process. So I'm doing exactly what I drew on the, on the whiteboard. Um, so um, I've forgotten what I was going to say now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, sorry, I just want to say, I'll get back to this fellow here. Sorry, because I think, over, yeah. I, I think John's got a really valid point here. And um, it, yeah, I think the, the thing is, the subverting the structure that you're in is actually potentially. Thing you can probably do. And it's actually quite exciting. And